In this video series, we've looked at a number of different techniques that astronomers use to measure cosmic distances. And for each of these techniques, we also have kind of a maximum range that these techniques are effective at. So we started with radar ranging and, and looking at the parallax of nearby stars, all the way building up to looking at supernova, some of the brightest objects that can be seen over a billion light years away, and ultimately getting up to using redshift to measure the distances to the farthest galaxies that we can actually see. And one interesting thing about this is that each of these techniques builds off of information that we learned from the previous technique. So say I have a, a, I've measured the distances to a number of nearby stars using parallax, I need to use those distances in order to build the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, the HR diagram, that we use to measure spectroscopic parallax. I need this information in order to be able to use this technique to measure the distance to star clusters. And I use these distances to help me calibrate the brightness of my Cepheid variables. And it just keeps on building on and on and uh, extending out to further and further distances. And this is really why we refer to this as the cosmic distance ladder, because each of these measurement techniques rely on measurements that are made at earlier points in the cosmic distance ladder. Now, although these sets of techniques have been extremely successful in allowing us to measure cosmic distances, I have given a somewhat uh, simplified or perhaps idealized look at how we actually make these measurements. And what I want to do in this video is just talk about a few of the issues that are associated with some of these measurement techniques and with the use of a cosmic distance ladder in general. So we can begin by looking at a specific example. Suppose I use my method of spectroscopic parallax to measure the distances of a number of different star clusters. Well, associated with any real measurement, you're always going to have some measurement error associated with that. Our telescopes only have certain sensitivities. We may be limited by the ability to identify the colors of each of the stars in, in uh, this cluster. In whatever way, there are going to be some errors present. Well, if I use those distance measurements to calibrate my Cepheid variables, to calibrate how bright these objects are, then those errors are going to follow through and will result in small errors associated with Cepheid variable distances. So we have this issue where all of the errors that uh, are made at early points in the cosmic distance ladder are going to compound. So small errors here get carried through the entire rest of the ladder. So we have to be careful to minimize this as much as possible. Another issue is that a lot of these techniques rely on us being able to find very specific objects specific objects and those objects aren't always present in galaxies that we want to measure their distances to. For example, Cepheid variables are very massive stars that generally have short lifespans. So we really only see Cepheid variables in relatively young star populations. So if I look at some distant galaxy and there hasn't been much star formation recently, if it's all comprised of very old stars, it's unlikely that I'll be able to find any of these Cepheid variables. Same thing for supernova. We can't tell a galaxy to all of a sudden have a supernova occur. We have to use sky surveys to just keep our eyes open at as many galaxies as we possibly can to hopefully see these supernovas when they're actually occurring. There are other difficulties with some of these measurement techniques. One specific one that we haven't talked about is the phenomenon of extinction. Uh, not the extinction as in the disappearance of a species of animal, but extinction as in the effect of interstellar dust on the light coming from a certain object. So let's say I have a source of light, maybe one of my standard candles, perhaps a, a Cepheid variable or a supernova and the light is coming from that object to us, but in the way, there's going to be some interstellar dust, and that will block a certain amount of the light coming from that source, making it appear dimmer than I would expect if there wasn't any interstellar dust actually there. 
So it becomes very important that we find ways to accurately account for how much extinction is happening if we're to measure the distances to any of our standard candles. So we see that with our cosmic distance ladder, there are still some open issues. And to go forward, we really have to find ways to either minimize or ideally eliminate some of these, uh, some of these effects. Or if we can't get rid of the effects, find some way to compensate for it or to accurately assess and model how much these effects are really changing our, our distance measurements. So let's start by looking at this extinction a little bit more. We notice that it's very hard to distinguish whether a source might just be farther away or whether some of this interstellar dust is just blocking more of the light. It has the same effect if we just look at the overall brightness of this standard candle. However, if we look at different wavelengths of light, the brightness from our source of different wavelengths of light, we notice that extinction will block off more of the blue light than the red light. It'll affect shorter wavelengths more than our long red wavelengths. So if we see the light coming from this source at a number of different wavelengths, and we notice that more of the blue light is actually being blocked, we can say that is because of extinction. If all of the light is uh, becoming dimmer at all wavelengths, we know that's because the source is farther away. So we can actually account for this effect. Furthermore, by really understanding this extinction effect, not only are we better able to measure cosmic distances, but we can actually use this as a tool to study the interstellar medium and, and figure out how dense the interstellar medium is and really start to map it out. So it becomes kind of an idea of one person's trash is another person's treasure. What started as a difficulty in measuring cosmic distances is now actually a tool to study a different area of astronomy. And this sort of pattern happens regularly often in astronomy. But getting back to the cosmic distance ladder, we've seen all of these different techniques for measuring distances. And although these are probably considered the primary methods that we measure cosmic distances, they are by no means the only ways that we can. There are a number of other techniques, some of which are just slight modifications on what we've seen here, some of which are drastically different. For example, when we looked at spectroscopic parallax, we looked at the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, the HR diagram, and looked at how the brightness of the main sequence stars kind of compares between the stars that we've measured with parallax and distant stars that we can only measure their color. However, there are other features on the HR diagram that we can match up and use as a distance indicator instead. There's the tip of the red giant branch, which is a brighter feature that's present in older star populations that we can use instead and can be used to measure distances that are actually farther out than this. We've looked at Cepheid variable stars, stars that pulsate and their brightness can be related to the period of their pulsation. But the Cepheids aren't the only class of variable stars. There are other stars like the RR Lyrae stars that have different brightnesses and different periods but can still be used in a very similar manner for measuring cosmic distances. Now, for some very different techniques, let's say I have a pair of stars that are in a binary orbit. Well, if these stars are in a binary orbit, and it just so happens that they're in an eclipsing binary orbit, so at some point we'll see them like that, at some point we'll see one pass in front of the other, then if we look at the total light coming from that star as a function of time, we're going to see little dips in that light as each star passes in front of the other one. And by measuring the amount of time these dips take and how much the dips take, we can determine the size of the star, their brightness, and once we know the brightness of the stars, we can use that to measure their distances. So this is a very different method of measuring distance. Now, when we start looking at galaxies, we find an entirely new set of measurement techniques that we can actually use. So, for instance, let's say I have some spiral galaxy that's rotating. Then the Tully-Fisher relation, Tully-Fisher, this relation relates the rate that this galaxy rotates at 
to its luminosity. And once we know its luminosity, we can determine its distance. The main idea of this is that the faster this galaxy rotates, the more mass must be present inside the galaxy. And the more mass that is present, the more stars there are going to be and the brighter that galaxy is. And this is just one of many different ways to look at different types of galaxies and try to use them as standard candles. So how does this actually answer some of our, our questions, our issues that we had before? Well, the more measurement techniques that we have, the more different kinds of objects that we can measure the distances to. So we aren't limited by only being able to measure the distances to galaxies that say have supernovas in them. Also, the more different measurement techniques that we have, if I look at an individual object and I measure its distance using a variety of these techniques, then if all of those measurements agree, then I don't have to be as worried that my I have some errors that are going to be in, this, uh, in these distance measurements. The more independent methods I have of measuring the same objects, the more confident I can be that those measurements are accurate. So we see that measuring cosmic distances is really an ongoing challenge in astronomy and being able to make these measurements more and more precise is really one of the challenges in astronomy today.